Tonight at 5, Reckoning with a Riot. This is important for us not to stand for a party or for, or for a president, but for the truth. There will not be a bipartisan investigation of the January 6th Capitol riot. We'll explain what comes next. Plus, the long weekend will start with sunshine, but we're tracking storms by Sunday. And a young man testifies against the school shooter he took down and disarmed. And we begin tonight with breaking news. Dr. Alex Marrero, the man who's supposed to become DPS superintendent next week, is now the subject of a federal lawsuit. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. Now, this lawsuit was first reported by our news partner, the Denver Post. It has to do with the way Dr. Marrero, Marrero handled COVID-19 while he was interim superintendent at the City School District of New Rochelle, New York. The complaint was filed today in the state of New York by the medical director of the New Rochelle District. Dr. Brooke Balkan claims Marrero tried to set up an illegal vaccination clinic for teachers in January of this year. And she alerted the state of New York and they shut it down. Now, Dr. Balkan claims as a result of that incident, Marrero retaliated and prevented her from returning to work after a medical leave. We have reached out to Denver Public Schools for comment. Nothing yet. One member of the school board, Tay Anderson, told the Post that he didn't know about the lawsuit, but he would like to learn more. Uh, but the news about Dr. Morero and the vaccine clinics has been out there for months. In fact, it was covered by an independent news outlet in New York State just days after it happened. Denver Public Schools received criticism for hiring a search firm and not doing enough due diligence on the hire. And this report will bring those concerns back to the forefront. As I looked through their bios, I looked at hearing uh, what they had to say, compare that against what the district needs right now in terms of the type of leadership that is knowledgeable, that is committed, that has a continuity uh, value added. Uh, they just want to fit. Again, we have reached out to the district for comment, and we expect a statement any minute. We have also reached out to Dr. Marrero. It is a photo that says a thousand words. A teenager, Daphne Westbrook, missing since October 2019, found in an SUV with Colorado plates. And her father, the man indicted for kidnapping her, remains missing. We know Daphne Westbrook is safe tonight. Investigators told us today Daphne's father gave her the vehicle to go visit her aunt. Well, police in Sampson, Alabama, pulled her over and then realized who they'd found. I was not surprised at her state because I knew that for the past 18 months, she had been essentially entirely withheld from social interaction. And the, the story doesn't end there. Daphne's mother spent the last 18 months praying for her daughter's safe return. She's not talking to the media tonight, but investigators gave us some insight on her state of mind. I spoke to her this morning and um, that her one emotion was just absolute relief because you know she she trusted us to to look at Daphne and say yes this is her she is alive she is well and and that for her was amazing it was a huge release for her John Westbrook her father remains missing tonight now he had been seen in Denver and in Pueblo in the last 6 months investigators say while Daphne is being polite she is not cooperating with the investigation and neither is John Westbrook's sister now, John Westbrook is an IT expert, and investigators believe he's able to move around without using cell phone towers and making a living on freelance computer security work. Police say John gave Daphne alcohol and drugs frequently. We're told he kidnapped Daphne after a custodial visit in October of this is 2019, possibly because a judge is ruling that he would only be able to visit every other weekend. So if you see him, take a look there. Please do call Crime Stoppers. Two years after Brendan Biley disarmed a gunman at the STEM school, he relived that tragic day in a Douglas County courtroom. Denver 7's Lance Hernandez spent the day in court, joins us live tonight. Lance, we got an unprecedented level of detail about what happened. A lot of detail, uh, and today jurors heard from six witnesses total. The first one, Brendan Biley. He is a classmate who was sitting next to Kendrick Castillo. Biley says the class was watching a movie on May 7th of 2019 when the defendant, Devin Erickson, walked into the classroom with a guitar case. At one point, he set that case down, got up, pulled out a gun, and said, nobody, expletive, move. Now, Biley says Kendrick Castillo charged the gunman and pushed him up against the wall, began punching him. Biley says he ran up to the other side, did the same thing, then heard two gunshots. He believes one of them hit Castillo during cross. 
Bailey was asked if Erickson pointed the gun at students or above their heads. He said, it was above my head. And under redirect, Bailey was asked when Erickson said he was sorry that Alec McKinney made him do it. During the time that he's being punched, one through five, does he stop resisting? No. Does he say, I'm sorry, Alec made me do it? No. Punches six through 10. Does he say, I'm sorry, Alec made me do it? No. Does he stop resisting? No. Tell the jury, what is the very first moment in your contact with the defendant when he stops resisting and starts saying, Alec made me do it? While Josh is on top of him and I have gained possession of the handgun. After you've peeled the gun out of his hand. The school's IT director also took the stand today. He says he saw Alec McKinney fighting in the hallway and that he had a gun in his hand. He says he grabbed that gun, went into room 207, saw Kendrick Castile on the floor, not responsive, but still breathing. At that point, I looked over at the Castillo family. Mrs. Castillo bent over and started crying, shedding tears. Her husband grabbed a box of Kleenexes. I then looked over at Mr. Erickson sitting at the defense table. He wasn't showing any emotion whatsoever. He just looked down at the table and was holding a water bottle in his hand. He was doing that most of the afternoon. Reporting live in Douglas County, Lance Hernandez, back to you. We need to understand what led millions of Americans to believe conspiracy theories about our own country and what led thousands of people to storm the capital of the United States. Senator Michael Bennett and other Democrats wanted to create an independent bipartisan commission to investigate what happened on January 6th. They needed to convince 10 Republican senators that the commission was a good idea. They only got six of them. Here's ABC's Alex Pressure in Washington. On this vote, the yeas are 54, the nays are 35. The motion is not agreed to. The outcome was expected. How it happened, not so much. Senate Republicans blocked an effort to create an independent bipartisan commission that would investigate the January 6th deadly assault on the Capitol by Trump supporters using the filibuster. Invoking the filibuster requires a 60 vote minimum to move forward any legislation. Ultimately, six Republicans joined Democrats in the 54 to 35 vote, falling short of the 60 needed to advance the bill. Shame on the Republican Party for trying to sweep the horrors of that day under the rug because they're afraid of Donald Trump. Top Republicans feared Democrats would drag out the investigation into the insurrection just ahead of the critical 2022 midterm election. Sources say Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell even personally worked the phones, urging his members to vote against it. This despite a passionate day of lobbying from family members of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who died one day after the attack, his mother going door to door yesterday pleading for support for the commission. Usually I'm staying in the background and I just couldn't, I couldn't stay quiet anymore. Notably after today's vote, no Republican spoke on the Senate floor. The bill did include several concessions House GOP leaders wanted from Democrats, including that the commission be equally composed of members from both parties and that both have subpoena power. But most Republicans are betting their base is ready to move on. A recent Quinnipiac poll found 74 percent of Republican voters say too much is being made of January 6th. But a majority of Americans, 55 percent, say that attack on democracy should never be forgotten. The White House responded to today's vote, saying that these lawmakers swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. And today, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. We hit another major milestone in the fight against coronavirus this week with our lowest single day case count in more than a year. Cases are going down. Travel numbers are going up. This holiday weekend will be the first holiday without widespread restrictions in more than a year. AAA is predicting the number of travelers will come close to 2019 levels. Now that I've been vaccinated, I'm feeling a little bit more uh, relaxed. I think people are a little bit more relaxed. Unfortunately, the long weekend <laughs> will hit right as our stretch of sunny days comes to an end. Stacey Donaldson is tracking the big change tonight. Hi, Stacey. That's right. Hi, we have cloudy skies here across the front range. A few scattered showers trying to get going, but it's mostly Virga uh, where the rain uh, 
disappears before it hits the ground. Now it's been very warm here for the Front Range and the Eastern Plains into the 80s this afternoon. We're seeing at 81 degrees right now downtown, 70s across the plains, 60s and 70s for the mountains. But from here on out, we're going to really cool things down going into our holiday weekend. We still have high fire danger through northwestern Colorado until 8 p.m. A fire weather warning and a few scattered showers popping up mostly through western Colorado at this point, but not much going on. These will be spotty showers that will disappear in through tonight. A few showers into southern Colorado. Colorado as well. But tomorrow, a different story. We'll see more widespread and severe weather down through southern part of our state. Scattered showers here for Denver and then more widespread rainfall going into the rest of our holiday weekend. Now tomorrow, our dog park forecast looks great. We'll only warm it up to around 70 degrees for the afternoon. So a cool down coming our way and then an even bigger cold front that will drop our temperatures and bring in a lot more rain going into Sunday and Monday. We'll talk more about the details on exactly what you can expect for the holiday weekend in just a few minutes. All right, thank you, Stacy. And this weekend will mark an unofficial rebound for a lot of businesses in our state, and Waterworld is one of them. Waterworld did not open in all of 2022. We had hired about a thousand kids last year who we had to give the devastating news that we weren't going to be able to open. First time in 40 years that we wouldn't be able to open. And so um, now that we're opening, they're ready to come back. 600 of them came back. Now, other pools and rec centers aren't so lucky. It is possible that every large front range city is hiring lifeguards. A search for lifeguard job Colorado will give you dozens of job openings, including Denver and Golden Inglewood, Weight Ridge, Littleton and Aurora. Local YMCA's are trying to recruit part timers and the city of Boulder announced today that it would adjust hours at four of its pools since it just doesn't have the staff. Next at five, meet the man who just sold his Denver liquor store for 93 times what he paid for it. Plus, meet the Olympian who is helping one mountain town rebound from a pandemic and a devastating fire. There's the misconception that the town is gone, but the town's very much here. And with so many places reopening, we continue the 360 conversation about whether masks are really necessary. 